Good morning, and I'd like to welcome you to our services today on May the 31st at the Perry Plains Church of Christ. This morning we're going to be looking at James chapter 1, verse 17. We're going to be studying about the gifts from God according to the context of James 1. Did you know that not all gifts are good gifts? Not all gifts are gifts that we like to receive, are they? We have been there and we've done that. I found that something that was very interesting on the internet. Uh, people get paid doing these kind of studies. What people do with bad gifts. Did you know that it, that study stated 30% would hide them in the closet? 21% said they would return them. 19% said they would give them away. And I just wonder how that 19%... 19%, how many of them rebox them as gifts to give to someone else? What do you do with a gift you do not want? This is a picture of a rare white elephant that was captured in the jungles of northwestern Myanmar. Uh, it's a Buddhist country in this particular area. And, and this is, picture was taking place, and this picture was, this elephant was captured on June the 29th, 2010. This particular elephant was estimated to be eight years old, and it is said that he was seven feet tall and four inches. To me, he looks a lot bigger than seven feet tall. Now let me give you a little bit of a side note. In the 16th century, the 1500s, there was a war between Thailand and Myanmar, then Siam and Burma, respectively, over disputed ownership of four white elephants. Can you imagine having a war between four white elephants? We need to realize in this particular part of the country that these white elephants were revered. They were very precious. There's a story told of a tribe of people who gave an enemy tribe a white elephant. The elephant to the receiving tribe was a sacred animal, especially considering its color, which was very rare. They dared not harm the elephant, for the elephant, for the elephant was sacred and a very holy animal, but instead they continually fed it and fed it and fed it and fed it, until the people started running out of food, and they would allow themselves to starve to death in order to keep feeding this elephant. And as these people were starving and dying, the tribe that had given them the gift then went in and took everything and then killed the white elephant. In this story, the gift was definitely not a good gift. In fact, the gift in that story caused a tribe's death. Some may surmise as we look at James chapter 1, the context of verse 17, the gifts or enemies are not gifts that are good. They are not gifts that we should enjoy. Think about that for a minute as we look at James chapter 1. Not all gifts are good gifts. The beta forbidden fruit, the beta forbidden pleasure, that's being dangled in front of you to allow yourself to be drawn away with your own lust. Oh, it looks wonderful. And you know it would be pleasurable. We need to remember that bait has a hook. Satan is not going to reveal the hook. He's going to keep it hidden. All he wants you to see is the fun, the pleasure in partaking of that desire. In luring you away from God, he will catch you on that hook and he will land you or myself in hell if we partake of it and stay there. In James chapter 1, we have gifts from two different sources. We have a contrast of the gifts from our adversary, the devil, and the gifts that come from God. 
when we take uh, the forbidden fruit, the forbidden gift, the forbidden pleasures, they will mature and bring forth death. It is the reality that some gifts are good, some gifts are bad. The first thing I'd like for us to observe in verse 17 is that God's gifts are good and perfect. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Won't it be some good gifts from God, someone asks? Someone may say, well, it's another day of life. I would agree. Another day of life to be with my wife, my family. Another day of life to share Jesus with someone else. Someone may say another gift of God is the beautiful sunshine that we're having today. And that's absolutely true. And believe me, one day we're going to be thanking God for the rain that we have in a few months when all the rain quits. Opposite of what we're having the last several weeks. Someone says some of your good gifts, your grandchildren, having a job, having ability to work. What about salvation and forgiveness and prayer and joy and peace that we have in Jesus Christ? In Romans 6.23 it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it states, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. In Romans chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Making a contrast between life and death in Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift, came upon all men unto justification of life. Now, let's do a little bit of a word study to understand what James is saying a little bit better here in verse 17. If you will notice in the King James in our English language, it appears that gift is the same word. That is not the case in the original language, in the Greek language. The two completely different words. The, the Koine Greek is a beautiful language expressing uh, things with words better than what our English language does. Hmm. I say I love my dog and love my wife with the same breath. Are we comparing that love between a dog and a wife? I love spaghetti, steak, angeladas, and I love my grandchildren. Are we making? Are we saying that we love both with the same intensity and same degree and so forth? And we've got many other illustrations that we could use. We need to understand that good, every good gift and every perfect gift are, are two different words, the two, the, the two word gifts here. But did you know that the one word gift used with good and perfect in the original language is completely different words? We have dosis, the first gift, the good gift, which means a giving or the act of giving. Then the second gift, uh, dore ma, which is the thing given, or the thing given, the gift that is given, is complete, that it is whole, that it is mature. Now look at your Bibles very carefully. Every act of giving from God is good. That's what it is literally stating. Every act of giving from God is good, and His gift is perfect. So let's go a little bit further with this. Every act of God's giving is said to be good. Everything God gives is declared to be perfect. The adjective translated perfect is from a word that carries the idea of completion. So this is what we have. God's gifts 
are those without any deficiency or wrongful omission. There's two psalms that I would like to share with you. The first one is found in Psalm chapter 107, verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for what? His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Psalm 52, verse 1 states, Why do you boast an evil, almighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. Look, the goodness of God continues. We need to praise the Lord for His goodness, for His wonderful works. Where is the problem? The problem is with Billy, myself. The problem is with you. The problem is with mankind. We can take that which is good and perfect and use it in an evil way, in a sinful way, and in an imperfect way. And when we do, that does not rob God's gifts of their goodness. Let me illustrate this just if, uh, uh, with a pocket knife. Just a few minutes ago, I had to use my pocket knife to unscrew a screw. I can use my knife to clear the fish. There's many purposes that we can use a knife that are very good. But people can take a knife and use them in a very evil, a very sinful, in a very bad way. Why can't we take a knife with us on the airplane anymore? Why can't we take a knife into the Capitol? Why can't we take a knife into the, the Senate or the House of Representatives and so forth? Now, let me ask you something. Just because some people abuse use a knife in a wrong way, does that mean that I am supposed to cease from using a knife? Absolutely not. What about food? Isn't food a wonderful gift from God? This desire that we become hungry and, 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 and to fulfill our hunger. But food can be used in a very sinful way also. When we use food in sinful ways like some people do and sometimes we do, should we stop eating altogether? Absolutely not. Take intimacy as an example between husband and wife. It's one of the greatest gifts that God has given man. And intimacy provides many purposes such as security and pleasure and the expression of love one towards the other and fulfilling uh, intimacy in the life of another individual, your wife or your husband. And when we are intimate, uh, with our wife or with our husband in, within the boundaries uh, that God has given us. Uh, uh, intimacy is supposed to be between husband and wife and husband and wife only. Uh, and, and although some people abuse it, are we to cease from it? Of course not. It is a wonderful gift that God has given husbands and wives. But it can be used in sinful ways. Some people prostitute it. They use sex in a very selfish way uh, outside of God's boundaries of marriage. They use it to manipulate and control the other person. They use it to get what they want, thinking their own desires. And they will use it in a vindictive way to vent out our anger. We need to realize today that all gifts are good and perfect that come from God. If they're used within the boundaries and His purposes, and the quality of these gifts never change, they are righteous, pure, lovely, and good. And in view of this word study, there's no room for any allegation that God might in some way be deficient in what He gives or how He gives. Let's go back to James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted. Remember this as we studied the last two weeks. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. All God's gifts are good and perfect. He's always good in what He gives. And His gifts are always perfect. Secondly, from what place are these gifts being given? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down. Look at this very closely. Every good gift, every perfect gift 
It's from above. You come down from above. There's that ETH on that word cometh. Anytime you have ETH, basically at the end of a word in the English language, in the King James Version, it means on a continual basis. So these good gifts, these perfect gifts, these gifts that are perfect, that are coming down, this act of giving from a very loving God, that these gifts are, and His attitude is good towards us, He says they are, they are habitually coming down from above. They are endless. Continual. It's a present tense participle in the, lead, in the Greek, which pictures a continual or constant flow of good things coming down. What a wonderful truth in contrast to men who give good gifts on rare occasions, but God perpetually gives good gifts to His children. No one can outgive God. James 1, 5, God is liberal in His giving and upbraideth not. He says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He gives to all men liberally. And upbraideth not, it shall be given him. Number three. These gifts are continually coming down from the Father of lights. Who is the Father that James is referring to in this verse? We have the word pater, Father here, which means generator or male ancestor, the original or transmitter of anything. In the plural, it could refer to parents. When, where, and how do the lights originate? The Father of lights. How did the lights originate? Go back to Genesis 1, verses 14 through 19, and you can study. God said, let there be light. And there was light. He created a greater light to rule the day, and He created a lesser night, a light to rule the night. Go back to Genesis 1. We see the what lights James is referring to in James 1.17. We see who is the father of the lights, the one who created them, the one who spoke them into existence with the power and authority simply of His Word. He just spoke them into existence. And may I add thee that these are 24-hour periods, day and night, the evening and morning with the first day, the second day, the third day, and so forth. They were day and night, just as when James wrote these words, and just as we experience today, they are 24-hour periods, just as it was in Genesis 1. We cannot read Genesis 1 without understanding the time period. And it's the same time period that we have today. We haven't got time to study this further. But we need to go back and study God's Word. And understand that these were 24-hour periods. In Psalm 136, verse 1, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. His mercy continues and continues and continues. And in verse 7 of the same chapter, To Him that made great lights. Who's that? The Lord, for His mercy endureth forever. To Him that made the great lights is the Lord. We ought to give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Here is one, a Father in heaven. God who created the moon, the stars, the world, and even else, and who were we? For Him to be mindful of us and to visit us. Not only is God the Father of light, He is light. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light. And in Him and in God is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. 
and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Look back at verse 7 again. But if we walk, three hints here indicates continual action, that we continue to walk, that we are walking in the light as He is in the light. We have, we are having fellowship one with another. And the blood of Christ, His Son, Jesus Christ, is cleansing, cleanseth us. It is ongoing as long as we're walking in the light. So that means even when we walk in the light, we have sin. And the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses from our sin. It doesn't mean that we're leaving God. It doesn't mean that we're living in sin. It means that we do sin. And there's a difference in sinning and living in sin. And all of us understand that particular difference. So, what does light represent in God's Word? It represents God. God is light. In Him is no darkness. In reference to heaven in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, it says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, But the path of the just, the righteous, is as the shining light. Light symbolizes righteousness as the morning sun. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom He shine as lights in the world. So Paul likens God's children who are blameless and pure to shining stars in the sky in this dark and perverse generation. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So Jesus uses light as a picture of good works. What is the opposite of light? It is darkness. If light symbolizes or is a metaphor for righteousness and goodness, then darkness signifies evil and sin. Everything that light is not. 1 John 1, 6, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Why? Because in Him is no darkness. 1 John, chap I'm sorry, yeah. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. We're told that God is light. God is holy, righteous, with no sin. no taint. He is not tainted with iniquity or injustice or unrighteousness. And we need to realize that darkness and light do not mix. What happens when a room is totally dark and you add light to it? The darkness disappears, doesn't it? What happens when there's light in the room and you add darkness? The darkness again disappears. Why? Because there's light in the room. We're familiar with John 3.16. Probably next to John 11.35, it's the most, probably one of the most familiar scriptures in the Bible. But how familiar are we with three verses later? John 3.19 through verse 21. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now look at our con context here. Think about our context. And, and we need to realize that all gifts are good. They're holy. They're perfect. For God is holy and perfect and good. And think about Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11. Do you think that if my grandson or granddaughters asked me for some bread, I would give them a stone? Of course not. Of course not. Listen to what Jesus said. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? God is a giver of good things. They come down from above. 
from the father of lights. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. James 1 tells, must have, tells me that they are continually coming down, showering us with blessings. Number four this morning. With God, there is no variableness or shadow of turning. God is solid. He is dependable. He does not change His mind at the spin of a dime. So who is fickle? Is it God? Of course not. It's us. We are the ones that are fickle. We change our attitudes. We change our actions. We change our behaviors. Depending on what someone says to us, depending upon circumstances and situations in life. Maybe it's which side of the bed that we roll out of in the morning. Some people you do not want to talk to and they've had that cup of coffee in the morning. You just don't want to approach them. It's like shadows. We are constantly shifting when even wandering from God's paths in our lives at times. Robert Robinson captured this in his song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Now if you will notice that a few words are changed in the original song compared to some of our songbooks today. Listen to what he says. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. And this is the part that's left out. Prone to wonder. What shadows turn. Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. So here's the beauty of God. God does not change. God is dependable. He's never changing. Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Psalm 102, verse 27, But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Psalm chapter 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today, and forever. There is no prejudice on God's part. And this is extremely important to us. <coughs> Excuse me. Because that means we can have complete confidence that when God says something, He means it. And it will always be true. The lights God created vary, and, and they vary in their intensity. But God does not vary in His perfect giving. The sun and moon cast shadow in their revolution as when the moon turns her dark side to us or the sun is eclipsed by the body of the moon. As the sun rises in the east, shadows are in the west and vice versa. But God is always constant and immutable in His character. His love is unconditional. He knows what is needed in our lives. He's always there to give His perfect gifts. God's benevolence is like a light which cannot be extinguished, eclipsed, or shadowed out in any way or form in the context of this chapter. It is God who never changes. Question, is God going to change now and lead us into sin? Is God going to change now and tempt us? Dangle something in front of us to lead us into sin? Of course not. We can rest assured that God will never cease being perfect and holy. We can be assured that God will never try to tempt us to sin. He will continually shower us with good and perfect gifts. And I leave with James 1.13 in light of verse 17. He says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Sin 
is an inside job. It doesn't come from the outside. Every man, when he is drawn away with his own lust and is enticed. Remember, temptation is not sin. Jesus was tempted and did not sin. In Him was no sin. Temptation is when we take whatever that our adversary, the devil, is dangling in front of our eyes that we desire and we partake of it. It brings forth death. Remember, death is separation physically, spirit and body, but death spiritually is separation from God. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9. When Jesus Christ comes back, He's going to come back with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on two groups of people, those that do not know God and those that do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ without knowing God. And they will be separated from the very presence of God, from the very glory of God. I cannot imagine what that would be like. My friend, Jesus Christ is the answer. It's the blood of Christ that continually cleanses us from our sin. Jesus is light. God is light. God's Word is light. But then that is what we need to walk in. Are we walking in that light today? I hope that God enriches you with spiritual blessings. But friends, the Bible tells us that these spiritual blessings are only for those that are in Jesus. Are you in Jesus Christ? Thank you for listening.